What's on, where, and when? It's the Talk of Nelson. Talk Nelson Radio. The Marco Rugby Roundup. Welcome to another episode of the Marco Rugby Roundup. I'm your host, Chris Butler. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Sean Edwards and <laughs> Les Davies. <laughs> we thought we'd mix it up this day. Uh, Les Edwards and Sean Davies, nice to have you here. It's lovely Christ- to be here. No, uh, Christopher. <laughs> I don't know. How many, do you have like a separate wardrobe for you, the amount of rugby shirts that you have? Oh, it's We're, always great, good to grab an old shirt worn in the past. This one's from the Guam Rugby Football Club, so... Uh, I, I was there for three years and played a bit of footy with a, a team called the Old Soap. The Old Soap. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the inference being with the beer mug on it that perhaps not quite as, as much playing as there was as... Um... Play hard, play hard. <laughs> you must have a big wardrobe. Thank yeah. you. I do, yeah. Nice to have you here. And it's our great pleasure to welcome as our special guest, Community Rugby Manager, Kahu Marfield, nice to have you here, mate. Uh, yeah, good to be here. Um, I've watched uh, 95% of the the podcast. Oh, and, nice. Uh, yeah, really in, enjoy the insights to the players. And How come stuff. we haven't had you in earlier, actually? that is there any reason we haven't had... <laughs> <laughs> You're getting desperate now, so you, you just work your way down and, uh, oh, here we go. So the, the lower your Marco number, the later you come on the show. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So number one, we're looking forward to number one. Yeah, one day. Who is Marco number one, actually? John Brooks. John uh, Brooks. Oh, right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Our venue sponsors are Shedigan's on Bridge Street. If you're in search of the perfect spot to catch all the action, especially now that we're getting into Rugby World Cup semi-finals, O'Shedigan's is the place to be. Without further ado, do, it's time for the Shed Chat. Yeah, Chris. Uh, the week thanks, mate. Another, another big week, obviously. Um, massive result Sunday morning. Uh, yeah, Liz was here with us, and the, the, the environment was... Uh, Fairly tense for the last few minutes, mm. but um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah it? A, a relief to get the job done. And contrastingly, Monday morning was um, not quite as busy, but we still had about 30 odd, 20, 25, 30 French people predominantly yeah, right. in to watch right. the game. And the mood was obviously quite a bit different coming into that game. So they were, um, yeah, they were, they were very emotional. I was t- telling these before the game, uh, before the we started here, um, yeah, a lot of tears Monday wow. morning, and they, wow. they were they were genuinely convinced that this was their year. And um, yeah, it was all a little bit awkward to say goodbye to them after that. But um, yeah, I do, I do. Feel, there was a lot. There was a lot of hugging and tears as they walked out of the bar. But um, no, a lot of a lot, a lot of fun, mate. And we'll go again this weekend for sure. We've got a bit of an Argentinian community here, actually. So shout out to them. And um, you know, uh, there's a table here already for them to go. Big yeah, breakfast. exactly. Yep, yep, yep. There we be. Um, You'll have yeah, to get some steak. Yeah. <laughs> steak. Large steak. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, we won't be able to feed the whole Argentinian football uh, rugby team. <laughs> that. That's all right. Uh, no, yeah, we'll be ready to go, mate. We'll pump all, all, all hands on deck for uh, Saturday morning. Spot to be, O'Shedigan's on Bridge Street. Let's get into the Bunnings Warehouse NPC. And, um, yeah, exciting time at the moment, isn't it? And we're into the final. And uh, isn't it fantastic to see the regional provinces in the final? Uh, Taranaki versus Hawke's Bay. And um, did you happen to catch the uh, the court? At, no, where are we? The semis? Yeah, yeah, semifinals. They were a bit like the World Cup, to be honest. So uh, really intense um, and went down to the wire. And, um, you know, uh, chances uh, were taken. And, you know, uh, Taranaki and Hawke's Bay took the spoils. Uh, yeah, yeah, against the bigger provinces too. So uh, most people wouldn't have probably tipped it that way. Although we certainly thought Taranaki at home yeah, would, be, think, would be good. Yeah. I think if I recall, is I I tipped Hawks Bay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you did. Yes. You Wellingtonians. <laughs> um, but 2014 is the last time two regional provinces mm. played mm. in the final, and that wow. was Taranaki versus Tasman. So yeah, shades of 2014, and that's that's a good thing for rugby. I was just thinking during the week, uh, the Hawks Bay story, because it's probably not too dissimilar, although they've had a great pass history. They've had a long history, the Magpies, but the fact that, um, you know, they were sort of in that second division, a bit like us, and we had some great battles against them, and now they're knocking on the door of maybe taking the premiership. That's a great story, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah look, a good province, a really good province, and and they're passionate. They, they attract really good rugby players. 
um, Kahu, you'd agree with that, are you? Oh, 100%. You, you play Hawks them. Bay, um, yeah, we're, we're always our sort of battles in the second division, but, um, you know, they're very similar um, province to us. Uh, and, yeah, again, just to see them have some success is, is pretty good. But, um, yeah, I'm picking Hawks Bay. Picking Hawks Bay. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I, I tend to agree with, with Kahu. They, there's something to be said about the... Um, the momentum and and I know Taranaki are going to be tough and they've been they've been playing good footy but just watching that Hawks Bay team and they're just starting to get used to winning and 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 believing they can win from any spot in the game so I think I think they'll get up there just to finish finish the fairy tale season I think yeah or well, chase Tia 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 gives them a a, a bit of X factor um, I do like Taranaki at home at New Plymouth though I think that crowd will get behind them I was just wondering that home ground advantage is going to be pretty hard yeah Isn't well. It? 2014 we went up there and yeah it had the the original grandstand too so that will take away four or five thousand but they do love to get into it up there um and very parochial at the end um uh the left end uh so yeah they like like to give it to you so yeah. uh yeah no we'll we'll be tough and and yeah taranaki deserve to to host but i mean hawks bay have shown that they can do it away from home i mean yes tipping up Wellington twice. Well, that's you know. the thing. And the, the, the adversity, I think, has brought them, you know, the, obviously the, the, the dramas off the field has brought the team closer together, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that. And they're like sort of circle the wagons and let's just do it for the boys. And not only that, I mean, for the community, because the community itself has been absolutely bombarded. It's been yeah. hammered and it's going yeah. through a real tough time. And it's not unlike what Canterbury had to go through with the earthquake. Um, so, you know, sometimes when you're in that dressing room, you're saying, well, lads, we're doing this for our community, are doing it tough and they need some joy in their lives. That's, that's probably a motivation there, isn't it? Absolutely. All signs point to Hawke's Bay. <laughs> well, <laughs> what are you thinking? <sighs> yeah, come on. <laughs> come on really tough. Well, I, I, under normal circumstances, I'd go for Taranaki at home. But it, but Hawks Bay have proven that 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 doesn't seem to be a thing for them, you know. And I just wonder, Taranaki have already been there before. Their defence has been amazing, Taranaki. But Hawks Bay have got this tenacity, you know. They've been behind and they seem to come back and be able to get the job done. And um, so I, I can't call it actually. So maybe you just got to go for Taranaki. You got two Hawks Bay. I'll go for Taranaki at home. Thank just you, mate. Due to home ground advantage and defence. I've watched this space. <laughs> uh, so, oh, do we know what time it's been? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Yeah. Saturday. Saturday. That's okay. great to have a afternoon game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, takes it back, I think, to the glory days. I, I remember you know, Carisbrook and Otago, Auckland, I think. You know, and pack crowd sun shining hopefully it's not raining yeah it and, they, and, and it gives them their own space so you've got the women the black ferns playing seven o'clock on saturday yeah, night yeah, yeah. against france so yeah it's great good I, day yeah it's a great yeah, absolutely. day absolutely yeah. and, and and the ground's a good ground when it's sunny i mean you can't do it these days but i saw this footage last night of uh why uh, Waikato uh, winning the Shield against Auckland, a young side. They were a second division side at the time, and the crowds all came onto the sideline. In fact, they come up to the goal line um, and, uh, and uh, just waiting for the final whistle, and they all just absolutely... And the players couldn't even get it off the pitch. They were just stuck with um, getting lifted in the air and given beers to drink while they carried off the field. <laughs> so uh, a bit of a different environment these days. All right, Rugby World Cup, and geez, what a weekend that was. I mean, we knew it was going to be big, but, uh, you know, I don't think we realised uh, just how big. And so let's go through them. First of all, Argentina versus Wales. Well, you know, there's no way I picked this. I, I thought Wales were in good form, and I thought the start of the game, that they looked like that, but Argentina showed some tenacity and tipping them up in the end, 29-17. Yeah. So thoughts on the game? Yeah, kicked away in the end a little bit there. I I think um, yeah, the Welsh will be probably a bit frustrated. They they probably should have been able to hold that game. Like you say, that first 20, 30 minutes of that game, they were in full control. And um, yeah, Argentina were looking just to hang on, but once they get the momentum up, they're pretty hard to stop. And um yeah, momentum and energy and, and a couple of calls went their way and they weren't looking back. Um and yeah, Wales just couldn't stick with them in the end. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Argentina's campaign's been on an upward burn um, and they're starting to play with that passion. So it's a real watch out for the ABs in the semi final, uh, the way they're playing the game. And and it's true that once Argentina do get their, their uh, nose in front, their crowd starts getting energetic. They get enthused. Uh, tough team to beat once they're in front. Mm. Yeah, no, that, um, or oh, the last quarter, you know, it really changed the game. And once that uh, Argentinian crowd get into mm. it, it's very reminiscent of the Rugby World Cup, you know, uh, the Soccer World Fo- Cup. Football, football Cup, World yeah, Cup, that's right. Yeah, and the, the noise that... Um, Probably the smaller part of the crowd can make, uh, but it just really lifts the players. Um, now yeah. we're getting some inspiration from their football football yeah. fellows because that was a slow start for them, getting tipped up by Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. but then coming through with the goods. So um, it's going to be interesting. We'll come to that. Uh, we'll leave New Zealand Island till last, but England 30, Fiji 24. Yeah, and, geez, that was pretty close too. England off to a, a good start. We thought their professionalism would come through, but Fiji uh, almost tipped them up. Yeah, I think that's, um, <clears throat> well, it, it sort of played out the way I think most of us sort of thought it would. It would be a close game, and Fiji, with their energy and, and momentum, um, kept them right in it with a bit of fighting spirit. But, yeah, England managed to hang on uh, right to the last few minutes and kick, kick their way to victory, but... Um, yeah, probably more points than I thought there would have been in that game. But um, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on the English, this English team, whether or not they can do anything to South Africa. But uh, you know, they're they're quite happy to be in uh, what you'd maybe call the easier side of the the quarterfinals. And you know, now they're one win away from from a World Cup final. Isn't that interesting? Because they were really written off before the tournament, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, I, I agree. But it is where they are in the in the pools, and uh, yeah, so. They're the only undefeated team, aren't they, in the in the competition? Must be. So, right? so uh, yeah, good on them. But uh, I was disappointed for Fiji. I thought they yeah. they did a lot, and I think a few things didn't go their way. Um, certainly, the end of the game was very strange. They 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 should have got a penalty there, but not not to be. Did you happen to catch the? Yeah, I did. Um, or the end of it actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like like. England know how to play finals footy, and that ultimately is what they bank on. So, yeah, they drop goals, penalties, uh, a couple of tries there. So, you know, they, yeah, they've gone under the radar a bit. I think the other um, Six Nations teams have been right at the top of the ladder, and they've just sort of eased their way into it. But they'll be happy where they are. And, um, you know, uh, yep, you could say it's the easier of the quarterfinals, but still, Fiji, amazing yeah. uh, campaign, um, and the belief and and the players is uh, it was great to watch. Yeah, and a gigantic uh, quarterfinal, South Africa and France. What a game that was! Um, and you know, great start by France, and it was really probably just the attrition of the forwards. It was just an absolute forwards battle, wasn't it? Um, so, what were your thoughts on that game? Oh, that you know, that similar to the uh, All Blacks game, you know, that you could put that as a final. Um, and you know, just the flair of both teams in different ways. You know, Dupont, I was amazed watching him. You can see why he's the best mm. player in the world. You know, broken cheek. But his speed and his decision making, it was just amazing to watch. Um, but again, full credit to South Africa. You know, they took their opportunities um, and, and grounded out, you know, uh, and backed themselves in the last uh, three or four minutes as well. So, you know, um, massive, yeah. Obviously, for the hosts, it'll be completely gutting. Um, and maybe for the tournament organizers, not to have the, the hosts in the semis or the finals, but, um, that was always on the cards with the mm-hmm. with the structure of the pools and and stuff like that. So um, no, full credit to South Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thoughts? <clears throat> An amazing game of rugby. Um, I, uh, Carl Tanana commented uh, yeah. during the first half. This very much reminded him of Super Rugby in the way that the attack was mm-hmm. was all at the <laughs> forefront. Um, but then, you know, you tipped that South Africa's defence would would perhaps get them the win. Um, and and I thought that that was a great uh, move, bringing on Andre Pollard and Faf Duplessis. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. At at uh, at the end, because the little halfbacks' defence was mm-hmm. outrageously good in those closing stages, as was it across the you know across the line. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, right. Oh, my my thoughts was just that the the interesting part was South Africa sort of showed that they were willing in that second half to to not take the three points and and persevere for the for the seven. And obviously, once they got there, um, yeah. You know the result, one by one point. So yeah, and probably the best player on the park scoring it. Yeah, yeah, know? and I mean, that, and that'll be interesting, and in, and in whether or not they, um, the, the stars align and we can get into a final with them or not. But the, I think they'll they'll play that style all the way through, and 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 you know they won't necessarily just take the three points because they're on offer if they think they can get seven. I think the thing that struck me with, and we'll talk about New Zealand Island now, is. Uh, the fact that both France and Ireland towards the end didn't have any answers. I felt maybe France tired a little bit. They started off with an absolute hiss and a roar, and I thought, this is going to be a walkover. Um, but uh, it was just when, um, as you say, South Africa kept in the game. But as the game grew, they grew in confidence, and they certainly, um, you know, Foster's talked about defence a lot, um, especially with Shane Christie you know, making sure we've got strong defence and that showed with South Africa as well. No matter what France tried to do and in our in our game against Ireland, no matter what they tried to throw at us, um, they couldn't find a way through. So defence wins World Cups mm-hmm. and that's um, that was a whole true. So thoughts on our game, gentlemen? I think you summed it up, Chris. Yeah. Defence won that game. Yeah. You know, uh, all, of, all of the effort leading into it all came down to those last 37 phases. And the discipline shown by the All Blacks was immense. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think I seen one of the headlines was pre-match. You know, the 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 focus from the guys. I think I mean they're they're always on, but some some of these games you just know or you just feel like they're gonna they're gonna click. And right from right from the start, you know, the boys were on. It was always going to be a massive challenge, and and to come out on the right side of one's always a bonus. Mm. Yeah, obviously the intensity of the build up and the the past losses. Um, you know, galvanise the All Blacks, and you could see it in in just the 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 way they were during the whole week. You know, Aaron Smith spoke um, earlier or well, later on in the week, but you could just tell they were up for it, and I was pretty confident we we're going to win. Um, but you know, Test match footy again, um, little moments, uh, you know, tries like the Richie breakthrough to Will Jordan. Mm. You know all of those sort of things, uh, and then the ability ultimately to hold out for four minutes, thirty-seven phases, is is testament to the belief, self belief within that group um, or within that team. Uh, again, it was it was amazing. It's like Israel Dag said, we we did everything we could to throw the game away. <laughs> and and two yellow cards, two yellow cards. I mean, you know the the Aaron Smith one was. Yeah, that was a bit of a hard but it's call, 40 wasn't it? minutes, isn't it? It's 40 minutes playing with 14 minutes. Yeah, it is. And, you know, and we still on the odd occasion, we did this thing where, you know, I remember um, Geordie Barrett, I mean, he miscued it, but he tried to kick it and it went straight to an island winger. You know, we still at times do these silly things. And I heard an 85-year-old woman um, <laughs> saying she was over the moon. But if I see that Aaron Smith, I'm going to give him a smack <laughs> on the bum <laughs> for kicking it. Uh, straight back to them, you oh, know, hundred um, percent. You know, there's that's the old school. You know, don't kick it. You know, run it type thing. But I was saying before that there must be some stats around about defensive uh, penalties when you're trying to shut out the game because mm. South Africa did the exact same thing, kicked it, and then back their defense. But it is risky. Yeah. But uh, you know that if everyone buys into it, that's the thing. Is if they fully knew what they were doing and it worked. Yeah, I guess I am old school. So I think we, we won the line out twice, you know, and why not put a grubber through and then challenge the line out and then defend against them in their half? Why, you know, why give them the ball in that situation? Even like, you know, uh, at times we give them to it and they're this side of our, our halfway. Mm. And it, okay, back your defence, but why not do that on their line, you know? Mm. Um, but I, I guess, like you say, uh, Kahu, that's old school. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess, just the theory must be, you know, that that contestable kick um, potential to to get the knock on and end the game there with a scrum. But um, and and if not, yeah, defend defend your way to. Yeah, it just it just seems like um, you know it's fifty fifty to me. But anyway, hey mate, I want to give a shout out to whoever you know, and we do know they've got an amazing strength and conditioning unit, mm. but the the fitness meant. 
for that period of time, they weren't so tired that they were able to maintain their discipline, stay behind the hindmost mm. foot, not go diving in with hands into the rucks when, you know, a penalty could have been given away. The fitness at that end was oh, remarkable. Unbelievable, but but also tactical substitutions. You know, Dalton Popoliti, you know, you take off your captain, Sam Kane, who I thought mm. was the player of the match, to yeah, be honest. Yeah. Uh, I thought he was amazing. But to do that and take your captain off, um, that's a high level of trust there within that team. And, you know, he was absolutely gassed at that end of that 10 minutes he was on there for. But again, it just shows the trust within within the team. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and everyone, both sides, I think, were sort of, uh, you know, absolutely walking or mm. dragging themselves off the pitch. They were absolutely exhausted by the end of it. I think Ireland, that's what happened to them. They were bashing up, but they just run out of energy. And, and France, to me, was the same. So let's talk about this South Africa versus England. Picks, gentlemen, what do we think? I, um. If I mean, I think South Africa are, are probably clear, clear favourites based on form and and how things have been going. But I, I, I'd imagine the English will, will try and keep it into a um a bit of an arm wrestle and and try and um kick their way to victory. I'd imagine they mm-hmm. uh the challenge will be trying to um maintain some discipline and and keep those South African forwards away from any rolling moors close to the line because I don't think England have it in them to chase down a a lead if if South Africa get away on them. Um, so yeah, my tip would be South African forwards and defense to just be too strong. I concur. I, I think mm. South Africa, and this is probably the one where you might get a 13 plus result. Um, England will try very hard for 50 minutes to stay in touch, but I think South Africa have too much power. Yeah, I haven't seen the starting lineups, which is quite interesting because South Africa do change a lot, you know, and who they have at 10, who they have at nine, um, is always interesting. And do they stack their bench with the, the big bomb squad? You know, uh, yeah, leaning towards uh, South Africa. But again, winning rugby is not necessarily fancy rugby. <clears throat> Going up in threes, no doubt there'll be a drop goal and there'll be penalties. So it's how close they can stay uh, within, you know, South Africa might determine it. Mm-hmm. Oh, look, I'll, you know, I agree. I think South Africa have got the experience to do it. But um, interesting, this England team, isn't it? Just quietly yeah, doing their business. And I actually thought their forwards play quite well. You know, the so who knows, you know, and, uh, the, the, you know, they, they may do it with the boot. But, um, okay, New Zealand versus Argentina. The lineup's out, not much of a change. White Lock gets a start. Brody Retallick, that's just rotation, rotating the old boys, really. Um, and... Uh, Mark Tillier comes back on the wing, which we expected. Yeah, and, and Toki Yahoo at uh, reserve hooker. Yeah, that was yeah. quite interesting yeah. for me. I thought uh, Coles showed a lot of character in the uh, in the you know it, up leading up to that semi final and coming on and doing really good work. And he's got a lot of hurt from uh, previous experience. So I was a bit surprised with that change. That's all. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't. I, obviously, Cam Roygaard's obviously done. Well, I'm not, not done something, but tactically they're obviously seeing <clears throat> maybe a bit more um, defence around around the Finlay Christie option, and um, yeah, so he 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 maintains that spot. He did, yeah, yeah. and um, yeah, Dane Coles, maybe probably a little bit frustrated, but same thing, I guess he probably will be back if we if we go another week deeper. They might be saving him for the final, or they Possibly. might not be able to make up their mind for the yeah, final. Yeah. yeah, could be around the way Argentina play as well. You know, Takiyahu is a big ball carrier, mm. so we need some real go forward there. Um, but yeah, I do agree with, I think the Island test was always going to be intense uh, around that stuff. Um, feel for Leicester, to be honest. Mm. I, I don't mm. think he mm. did anything wrong, but. Um, you know, Mark uh, obviously had had his time off, um, and and will be chomping at the bit. Um, but yeah, do yeah. feel for Lester because I thought he he was great. Yeah, he Mark does seem to, you know, get that go for, doesn't he? he seems to slip a few tackles, doesn't yeah, he? Got great. He's feet. a he's a wiry uh, player. Must be strong, his, stronger than he looks. Yeah, he has power to weight ratio. It's a bit like Cheslin Colby watching him. Mm. You know, um, he's only 75, 80 k- k- kgs, but. Uh, Mark's the same, you know, he wouldn't be over 95, 90, 95, but his uh, ability to pop up and then just his footwork when when the big bodies are trying to smash him, 
could be the point of difference, you know, um, because they are big boys, the Argentinians. Uh, so that could be the point of difference with, with that selection. We've had close matches with them before. They've beaten us more recently, so they've got the confidence. Michael Checker will be way up for this game. Um, and, you know, we did have that close call. I think it might have been the quarters in a World Cup. Was it 2019? It might have been the one before, but it ain't going to be an easy match. And we can't, you know, the whole thing is about complacency. What's the mindset going to be like? Have we already decided that we're in the final? I mean, uh, we've got to be very, very careful. And it, after that big island game, you know, uh, can they can they hold that intensity up for the semi? Yeah, that'll be a big question. Well, I guess we'll find out. But um, yeah, I think I think that's I think for us, it's about um, keeping those points accumulating and um, not not letting the the Argentinians get too much momentum and and mm. um, you know we don't want to be chasing down a lead. No. If we can we can agree. Well, if we can get in front, hold the lead, and 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 um, back that our reserves can finish the game in the last twenty. I think is be. Bill but Anoka will earn his money for the mm. test. That that the mental side of this yeah. uh, game for the All Blacks, yeah. getting up after such a mm. marvelous performance and then maintaining the rage, that's uh, that's the job of uh, a very un, you know, unspoken hero in the All Blacks set up in mm. recent years, and oh, that's Gilbert Anoka. Hundred percent, and I think you might have heard um, Dane Cole saying about resetting on Monday, reset to zero type thing, mm. and that that is, has to happen. Otherwise, if you're still up in the clouds, you'll get a jab in the face and you'll be going home or you'll be going to third and fourth. You know? And so um, that will be front of mind with everyone there, senior leaders, everyone. Um, no semi-final of any World Cup is going to be easy. Sensing some nervousness. The boys over here, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. in the no, no, past, no. all they've ever done is go, it's not going to be a problem. It's going to be easy. we got this in it the bag. It's going to be a problem. This... We're just trying to... We're just trying to um... Shed some insight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it, it, all four of us are tipping New Zealand. It's a question of how by how much, Chris. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, I think I actually don't think against Ireland we played our best. I think defensively we did, mm. but I think there was a nervousness there. Mm. I've got a funny feeling we're going to turn it on, and we're going to blow them off the park because I don't. I think the boys have been quite conservative with their play. For good reason, um, there's been a big emphasis. I think it's going to be a tough match in the forwards, but if we can get um, our ascendancy there, I think the backs are going to fire. So I, I actually think, I mean, everyone talks about 13 plus. We don't do scores anymore, do we? But no, uh, 34 no. 17. There you, oh, there you go. There you go. Twice, <laughs> twice as good. <laughs> it's very specific. Twice as good, mate. Yeah, I think, um, I think something similar. Um, scoreline wise, I I think yeah I think we'll score the last ten to twelve points and uh, that'll push us push us out in front and I think we'll, we'll probably win by about that margin ten to twelve. Thirteen plus. Thirty fifteen. Yeah. There you go. All there right. Go. That's good. That's good confidence. All right. <laughs> You're with the Marco Rugby Roundup. It's our great pleasure to welcome Kahu Marfell, who is a long serving community rugby manager at the TRU and a foundation Tasman Marco player. Marco player number 30. Great to have you here, mate. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're from over Marlborough Way originally, and one of the very strong clan of the Marfells who played rugby for the Red Devils. Tell us about your early years growing up in Canvas Town and hanging around the Polaris Rugby Club. Yeah, well, when, when you could get on it when it wasn't uh, waterlogged. Well, that's the thing. If it's not currently there anymore, <laughs> yeah. so if you're driving to Blenheim, you've got the school on the left and the field or the paddock straight opposite it was the rugby field. Mm. So in a massive flood, it would be right underwater. Yeah, that's right. But um, yeah, no, Canvas Town. I, I love my time there. I, we're about one point five k down the road. Um, but you get on your BMX and you <laughs> chuck a bag and uh, ball in the bag and pedal up to the the park and kick around. It yeah. it was quite a. Um, I was thinking about that this morning. It's quite an. It was an iconic ground for the seniors to play at. You know, get, get changed behind the pub, <laughs> yeah. and you walk across the bridge. And yeah, and I was a ball boy or a water boy or whatever. I used to love it, you know, and um, yeah, the, the the rattle of the sprigs probably sharpening on, on a couple of them, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, and then you'd walk down there, and 
you know, uh, the p- cars were parked around the field and, you know, back then I'm guessing probably a couple of hundred. It felt like a couple of hundred. It was chocker, you know, but, um, you know, uh, growing up there was, it was great. Um, you know, it's funny. I was like the water, you know, like I'd go and fill up the water bottles in the river. Um, yeah. <laughs> run down under the bridge, fill them up. Nowadays, there's probably Dimo or slime, so you yeah, probably can't right. do that. But um, you know, it, it was quite an intimidating venue. It was uh, called the Boar's Nest. Uh, so there's some iconic names of Polaris, like the Bryants, etc., yeah. Wallaces. Um, and yeah, I, I used to love it. Uh, yeah, a few dust ups here and there. I remember when my uncle would play for Redwood Town way back in the day. Uh, and they came out, and they were stacked full of Red Devils. Redwood uh, were, and Johnny Johnny Mac was the hooker, and you know two four nine eight seven sheep shit was the call because <laughs> we'd we'd had to we had to move the sheep off the. Oh yes, that's uh, right. There was always uh, sheep on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Right. So we, it was our sheep. So we we'd move them off, and there'd yeah. be sheep uh, dung <laughs> everywhere. So oh, loved it. Yeah. So. Uh, so what year did you come over to Nelson to board at Nelson College and how much did you enjoy those rugby years? Oh, so uh, 1997, um, that was my sixth form uh, or year 12 nowadays. Uh, so yeah, I, I was Rye Valley area school, um, catch the bus out to school type thing. But yeah, 97 came over um, uh, to NC uh, and were two years there and, and I loved loved it. I was a I was a boarder um, at Fowl House, but you know it uh, it really opened up my eyes um, coming from little old Campbellstown. Mm. But uh, you know, living with your mates, playing rugby, you know, all of that sort of time at college, I loved. Um, that was some of the best years, and and some of the best memories because you know, at the time you didn't really appreciate what, appreciate what mum and dad did, you know. Uh, one boarding um, and two trips you know we went to, <laughs> I, I turned up in uh, sorry 90, 96 sorry um, and three months later I was in Paris uh, and <laughs> Italy a Piacenza with uh, an under 16 rugby team wow. you know? and wow. Salvi Gargiulio sorted it all out you know um, principal at the time and here I am, little old canvas down to uh, Eiffel Tower. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like going, oh, this is good. And, <laughs> and trips to, we had another first 15 trip to the Gold Coast, you know, in the July school holidays. And I'm thinking, this is this is Christmas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, now that I, I love my time at, 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 in the first 15 and, and Nelson College, uh, schooling wise. And yeah, um, <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, no, uh, yeah, great times. Um, so you were an integral part of the first 15. So who were the coaching influences there and who were the standout players of that era? So it's, it was interesting. Um, we only ever really had one coach. Um, it was Gary Barkle. Uh, I'm not too sure if you know Gary. He, he played for uh, Canterbury. He was a halfback, a lawyer locally. Um, he was great. But, uh, you know, I think I, re- I recall that the Fords, we sort of used to coach ourselves. Right. I don't know whether it was a high level of trust. Um, we had some reasonably experienced uh, players or, yeah, players that sort of understood. Uh, Callum Taylor, uh, Mike Kerr, a couple of guys. Uh, Callum's local now. Uh, Mike was a, a great leader there, uh, Nikolai Anderson. So there's there's some names there that no one will know, but when you were back then, they were the legends of the school, you know, and, um, you know, so yeah. And around that time, uh, Ross Soper, James King, oh, Ross um, Soper. yeah. yeah right. So Soaps, uh, yeah. he, he made New Zealand schools in yes. 97. Yeah. Uh, Kingy, um, you know, uh, went on to play, uh, for Wellington. Uh, so, uh, Taranaki. So yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. There's some good players. We, we didn't really have the miles to add a cup back then. So it was, you played senior quad. Uh, oh, you had quad. Always had quad. Mm. One quad twice. So that oh, was wow, good. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not a, if you're doing that, that's a good solve. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. well, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Quinny. <laughs> sorry, Quinny. You know, you didn't win. But, um, you yeah, know, we had quad and that was massive because we hadn't yeah. won it for 20 odd years. Yeah, right. Um, 
So we won at 96 down at uh, Christ and then at home in 97. So that was massive. Yeah. Uh, that was like the pinnacle at school then. We yeah. failed at top four. We probably got ahead of ourselves. We'd beaten Rongatai by 70 points in a traditional. Then we went up to Wellington and got beaten 21-19. So, you know, mm. it's mindset. <laughs> we could have done with Gilbert uh, session yeah. on uh, yeah, yeah. mindset, you know, and that, that probably was probably a failure for us. But again, we'd play beaten Christchurch boys, had Aaron Major in it, um, you know, all those sort of teams. We were we were one of the better teams around, but ultimately no competition to play in in first 15. Mm. We played Div 2 uh, against all the old guys. <laughs> it was like, yeah, you're schoolboy and trying yeah. to rustle you up. But, yeah, you know, getting tackled. I remember getting tackled by one of my idols who I used to idolise was Willie Dempster, oh, yeah. uh, number eight for yeah. Nelson Bays and I took it off the back of the scrum and absolutely got smashed <laughs> from the side on front field. And then I was like, whoa. And then I was like, oh, well, that's Willie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he, good. He, you were playing, uh, you know, he'd retired from the Griffins and that by then and he would have been 35, or so maybe, and got, you know, got beaten up by, you know, the old <laughs> guys. The legends, yeah. yeah. Um, so after leaving college, uh, where did you end up with your club rugby? And um, tell us a bit about those days. Oh, club, yeah, club. I left um, left the college, and, and actually this is, yeah, a li- maybe a little bit controversial, but I went to Nelson uh, Club, Dave Fisher, basically, as a, uh, <laughs> as a local um, coach here, and he, he shoulder-tapped me quite, yeah, and got me there, uh, and, and played for three years there, three or four years there, and we managed to get a championship. Um, uh, and then I went down to Christchurch to try and be a, you know, a, uh, Canterbury player for one year um, club uh, and it was around the Crusader stuff um, but didn't really fit down there um, so I came back and uh, at the time uh, yeah the, the personnel um, had changed uh, and there was a few things there so I actually uh, played a lot of my rep footy with Briggsy, um, Terry Whitecliff, all those Cullum and all those and they were at Maris so yeah I went to the dark side <laughs> <laughs> or the green side <laughs> or the green say. side you know the evergreen you know the best side <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no I still have a few Nelson old boys that give me the look but hey yeah. you make the decisions when you're young and, and you go with it but then had great times with Marist um and and managed to get a couple of wins along the way uh, and and you know and and as you do you celebrate those wins with the with the lads uh uh, but yeah, no, I had thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time with Marist and still got lifelong mates with there and uh, still enjoy watching club rugby full stop. But, mm. you know, uh, people say what club you are, you know, it's, um, you know, Marist. Well, that's good. I mean, these guys are right here, aren't they, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you can tell I, me after. I was going to take off my top like Q Mac did <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and have a central one on, but no, I've no, oh, got to yes, stay neutral right. um, when in, in work hours, you know, because <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, I still coach. Right. I coach Maris, my, my boys, uh, my daughter's plays there, so my wife basically runs the junior club, so, oh. you know. So, uh, Tracy and, and Kahu are an integral part of the Marist Club. I remember when I joined in 2011 at Tasman Rugby Union, you were still having a crack at club rugby and he'd lie down on the floor at work and try and get his bones back into, <laughs> into place. That was, I think, your last year, wasn't it, of senior rugby? That was that was 2011, yeah, and, yeah. And, and we managed to win the championship there, but I think went to two trainings that year. Yeah. Um, the coach at the time, Mike Fraser, was allowed me to do that i suppose neat well seeing that i could do be some uh benefit to the team played a few games towards the end but, uh, blew my back out so then <laughs> i got sciatic problems ever since so yeah uh, good career though and uh in and with uh various uh rep sides including the nelson bay griffins which you were selected for in 1997 and a team that you went on to represent 86 times um, up to 2005 when the Tasman Rugby was formed in 2006. So uh, back in those days, yeah. players weren't rushed into the starting lineup, were they? Um, you basically uh, learned your craft at training and on the bench. So how was it? How awesome was it to be part of a provincial uh, team like that at 18 years of age? Yeah, it was uh, pretty buzzy, to be honest. You know, um uh the first game was uh down in westport and 
you know, I was seventh form or year 13 and you're jumping on the bus with all these guys and you go down there and it was over the whole weekend and yeah, play the game, come off the bench. Uh, then, you know, you everyone used to layer it up back then. And then you go play a game on Monday and it was pretty, um, for at the time, you know, pretty surreal. Um, but no, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, playing with some of the guys that you watched um, previously as a, a 10, 12 year old um, type thing was, was cool. Um, yeah. And so, uh, no, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was quite an eye opener to be honest. Um, you know, I remember one, one of the games would come off and you jump in the shower and one of the guys, Adrian Webby had about 20 ruck marks on his back and I'm going, why um and he goes mate you got to do it and I, i'd you know i'd have like one scratch like, I'd be like, oh, wow and is it like i thought it was like probably not smart of him but back in the days the ruck laws were different so you could yeah. basically dive over and kill the bull but then you'd come out with all these ruck marks i'm going man that's not smart but, <laughs> no, hey. no, that's right. <laughs> but, but again you know those are the sort of things that you you, you you think oh man times have changed you know so yeah. uh no hundred percent it was uh it was a good time so um basically Nelson Bays what division and did you win any titles in your time yeah yeah no so we were uh second division um they got promoted in 93 I believe uh Milne and Donnie and all that back in the day yeah. so uh yeah we were we were second division and and we had a, a good run um from 98, 99 onwards, we, we managed to win the second division in 99 here on the park. Um, day game, 2.30 game, um, you know, uh, and then from then on, we were sort of finalists for the next two or three years. Um, Hawks Bay were the dominant team through 2000s. Um, I think they went three years undefeated uh, type thing, and so we always came up against them but in 2004 we managed to tip them again in the in the final back here um again uh yeah under you know um a good battle uh, and comes right down to the wire and it's very similar games like uh crowd charged the ground and mm. all that sort of stuff but it was uh yeah, always good battles there. You know, you had Bay of Plenty in there as well. Um, Clayton McMillan was playing for Bay and all those sort of guys. Still um, uh, next level, but it was, uh, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was great times and um, still got long, long life uh, friends around um, around those teams. Yeah, so winning a Div 2 title, did that mean promotion anywhere? Or? No, well, that was the day, 99 um, no, uh, 2004, you had to challenge the bottom place first division team, which was Northland um, at the time. So we, because we won, we got to host the promotion relegation and no promotion relegation team had ever won. And um, it just showed the level of uh, distance between division one, division two. Yeah. Um around they were full-time basically pros they had julian huxford who played for super rugby team as their first five and they came down and and we were we were close um again turning points we had a five meter scrum got free kicked against us attacking and then they kick it down 90 meters and get a line out and we lose the line out they score a try game over so it was it was quite a big thing um mm -hmm. you know uh but yeah would you get promoted to division one it would, it would, it would have been interesting to see what would happen there because you'd have to change your model of your business around because we were only like amateurs real amateur um but to to you know, play against the Canterbury's of the world back then when they had all blacks playing NPC and super rugby players. It was, uh, it would have been uh, quite a interesting. Would have been a quick rally. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing, man. Like we played Canterbury in a Ramfley Shield game a couple of times and they were 60, 70 points better than us. And mm -hmm. you sort of see it nowadays with the uh, Ramfley Shield going down to Heartland. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a, there is a difference because you are dealing with 
professional players versus amateurs. You know, guys who mm. go to the building site, then they have to go to the gym in the afternoon or in the morning. But whereas the uh, NPC players are ninety percent a mm. um, super rugby players, so they get that twelve month training, and and it's just uh, it's night and day nearly by the time you get to that. And uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if South Canterbury were to come up, what the difference would be. Yeah, you know? um, even against the Southland uh, or a Manawatu, you yeah. know, there's still a massive divide and, mm. and, you know, just training. Um, and yeah. Mm. So, um, 86 games, not many above you, but one of them was Robbie Melnick. You also played with Mark Bright. Um, so uh, both of whom became Marco, like you did, uh, Andrew Goodman, mm. a couple others, but, um, yeah. Who, who'd you love playing with? In the Griffins, um, Warren Johnson, Oh, was yeah. a yeah. um he's a legend of northland and again he was one that i used to watch when i was a kid um northland versus auckland in the ranfilly shield game on eden park and he does a 90 meter clearing kick of the old brown balls yeah, right. i'm going oh yeah how good and then next time i'm playing with him in 1999 but was it was the old school um you train hard and he was tough Love to tackle. Like he was one of the first first fives that, you know, stereotypes used to be first fives don't tackle, Mertz and the likes, but he used to lead the way. Um so I used to love playing with was and then ultimately after the game you'd, you know, you'd get out the gat and have a couple of beers and, and all that sort of stuff. So no, I love playing with Was um and the Griffin stuff. Um yeah. So yeah, very um, cool. Yeah. Now, mate, in four of those seasons when you were with the Griffins, you ended up being selected for what was called a New Zealand Divisional 15. So four years touring with, with that team. Um, and that's a chance to wear a black jersey, isn't it? Uh, how cool was that? Oh, that was pretty cool, you know. And, and because we were successful as, as the Griffins, we, you know, you you either win or you're top, you, you get a bigger chunk of the team. So, you know, you mm. Yeah, Mark Brights and yeah, Gavin Briggs is of the thing, which shout out to Sammy Briggs, uh, who made the divisional team this year. Um, but it, again, it, it was because we're amateurs, it was like, whoa, it's Christmas, you get a bag of Adidas <laughs> gear and <laughs> some boots and some shoes, and it's like, and then you get to go to uh, we went to Tonga, uh, Samoa, and Fiji, but also one of the years we just played down in Timaru, uh, but it was playing Ireland, for example. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, you, know, yeah. You, you play at Brian O'Driscoll, you know, and, that, <laughs> and that's the thing, and then you're in the showers, it's all communal, and it's like, oh, there's Brian O'Driscoll, and it's, <laughs> it's flip-flops, you know, type thing, and you go, oh, well, that's weird, but, um, you know, but, you know, to play play for your country at whatever level is uh, yeah. pretty cool. The national yeah. anthem, the huckers. Uh, so, no, I, I, mate, that, that, that was a uh, real, real buzz. So what was the purpose of the regional 15? Was it to try and get those little diamonds that they might have missed? Or oh, I think it's just New Zealand rugby, and they reintroduced it to a reward, you know, different levels. You yeah. Know, you, you have the All Blacks, the Ultimate, but then you have uh, a big focus on the twenties now, um, but the divisionals have its place, you know. Yeah. So you have uh, all the Heartland teams vying for ultimately the Meads and the Lahore, but yeah, yeah, the yeah. players individually get recognised um, uh, for a New Zealand selection at mm. that level, mm. you know, um, which is a, a huge buzz. You yeah. know, um, you don't get. I don't know if you get paid, but you get the kit and you get to travel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So play two games this year, they do. A couple of games and the bar, bar, bar bars. Um, and uh, Canterbury 15, I think, uh, which will be strong, you know, but there are uh, a couple of actually Maris boys in there Sammy Briggs, uh, Pino Mapisi, and uh, Doral, uh, Bucky. They, 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 oh, no, Bucky didn't. Sorry. Um, but, you know, for a couple of those boys, it's great, you know. Um, yeah, to yeah. get recognized for your um playing, yeah, yeah, uh, mate. <clears throat> once Tasman did enter the NPC, you were selected as a foundation Tasman Marco in 06 and 07. Uh, tell us a wee bit about how that first year went down and, and what it was like joining up with the old enemy, I guess, with Marlborough and um, <laughs> forming, forming a team for the region. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, there's always talk around Nelson Marlborough, you know, I see it, um, in the school games, I see it in the club games, you know, but back then, because it was new, um, it was quite, you know, it was, it was a real, oh, wow, yeah. we're, we're here. But again, once, you know, we played all our games over in Blenheim because we didn't have the stadia here. Um, we had to get an upgrade here. And so, 
Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. I think back to it now, and I think uh, you know we we were deer and headlights a little bit. Yeah, you know, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is pretty cool. <laughs> you know, and, and we had um, a few rock stars, as you would say. Um, and uh, so yeah, no, it was good. And and the Marlboro Boys, you know, because um, you played against each other, you battle each other, you might have a punch up with each other, but then next thing you have a beer with each other after the yeah. game. And so, you know, for example, Mark Stewart or Bull Stewart, Braden Thad, he was one of the foundation members, you know, he was from uh, Plorus and from Marlborough. But, you know, how cool then to go and play uh, yeah. with him, Tristan Moran and a few others, you know, yeah. it was, uh, it was real cool, you know. Um, no, it's good. Yeah. Uh, any of those early matches stand out to you? Anything? Oh, you know, because we didn't have too many wins back then. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah. Um, but the standouts probably, again, the deer in the headlight thing is playing at Eden Park against Auckland. It's like, wow, this is, they pumped us by 40. Um, <laughs> but it was pretty, pretty cool to, to play there. Same with the Caketon uh, in the Marco jersey, you know, so... Uh, I think we got Northland and Manawatu as one of our a couple of wins, you know. But even that North Harbour game, the first game, you know, I remember after the game, uh, the fireworks <laughs> up the back of the <laughs> number six is like, holy heck, they got fireworks. And so it's like, uh, yeah, it was pretty, yeah, there's lots of great memories, but not too many wins, but, you know, great times off. Times and and that, you know, needed to you know, be looked at, yeah, but um, refined. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, there were some players that went on to become uh, Marco legends, I guess you'd you'd say, with like likes of Robbie Melnick, Alex Ainley, and and Goody. Um, you mentioned a few guys. But what are some of the other players that you you ran around with that that that, that impressed you on the part? Oh, I was thinking about that. Um, one guy that was so underrated, but probably didn't reach his potential was Aaron Kamara. Um, those back in the day uh, would would recall he was a Southland guy. Came up, played for Southam when he was eighteen, and that was when Southam were in the first division. But um, he had so much talent, and it was just uh, you know uh, some of the stuff he could do on the field, uh, unbelievable. So you know you had had the likes of that, Timmy Taylor, you know uh, first five, um, you know. But the the Mark Brights of the world and Alex Ainley, Robbie Melnick, you know um, the founding guys that you know Goody, uh, it was just cool. It's cool. You know? Just cool to play with the guys that you battled against on Saturday in club rugby, and then go and and play um, NPC with them. Yeah. In the early two thousands, you were employed by Nelson Bays as a rugby development officer, and so it was a small team in those days. So, who employed you, and who did you work alongside? Yeah, well, that was um, you know I was ultimately trying to be a rugby player but uh you know uh peter Barr, um nelson bay's ceo and, and wayne love actually um who was the nelson bay's rdo at the time but um was doing a bit of coaching as well they they hit me up and you know it would have been uh, uh 20 odd 21 you know oh, but wow. it was um it was really around uh you know um they were you know delivering at schools and all that sort of stuff so they needed someone who was probably current in the plane so i'd play griffins kids and all that sort of stuff see you you go out and deliver all that sort of stuff so yeah no it was cool um yeah but peter and um and lovey uh gave me an opportunity um yeah and sort of that's where it all started so was it just mainly you in that role or did, did you work with some others or oh Mainly me, I was delivering uh, a lot of delivery. Yeah. You know, so you'd be at a school from nine till three, just delivering schools and drills and just having fun. You know, yeah. And yeah. Thing. But that can be quite draining. So I feel, I do feel for the teachers who have to do that every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, because like rugby season's rugby season. And I think it was like a eight month contract. So you'd do it then and then you'd have summer off type thing. But to do day, by day every day of the year i was like whoa well, mad respect to the teachers out there because um you know you you, you lose your voice you, you got to keep high energy all the time um because you can't just come in and go all oh, right there's the ball 
there you go you got to keep your energy high and so it was it was it was good but uh, it allowed me to still train and all that sort of stuff so it was, it was, it was uh, you know on the grass delivering uh, great so that kind of i guess morphed into in a way your current role because um the presumably through that work that you did do there was a lot of connections with clubs and schools and relationships yeah so at the start i was mainly delivering on the grass uh the schools um then that morphed into coaches and rep teams and stuff like that so that that connection you know i still have connections with club people from way back at the start you know and then and some hearty club volunteers out there that were back then you know in the early 2000s so um more um as it progressed it became probably less grass uh and more office and uh, delivery stuff around compliance and stuff like that and so yeah i I still today love going out there and coaching or running a tournament i ran a couple of tournaments last term and to see the joy on the kid's face is, is is amazing you know and you know you have some winners you have some losers but ultimately they're all out there having fun um and so you know i miss that part of it we are probably a bit more in the office base but still being able to connect with the clubs um try and help the clubs uh you know um yeah Mm. yeah it makes good sense man you've been um in a role with the tiu as the community rugby manager for a few years and there's probably not a lot of people um, around the top of the South rugby that, that haven't come across you in some capacity. Um, and, in that role, can you just talk us through what your focus is during the community um, rugby season, focus for the community? Oh, ultimately, it's around providing you know opportunities for anyone who wants to play rugby, you know, um, whether you be a five-year-old, a um, rewalker or a you know, a senior player in Picton, you know. Mm-hmm. It's around trying to give opportunities to people to play the game that we love. And, and you know, um, so a so big part of my role now is around coordinating a lot of the stuff around seasons and courses. There's a lot of compliance stuff now that has to be done. So, there, you know, um, a lot of that is my my role and then you know another part of my role is if someone gets sent off you know um they have to come and see me uh, <laughs> or i have to yeah. i have yeah, to sort them out go and see a uh, two or three panel you know so yeah. that's that's part of the game and unfortunately that is a is what it is but you know um a lot of it is around just setting up things and then running things you know and then hopefully everyone who's participating has an enjoyable uh time within that you know and within your role now is it have you got a bit of a, a support team that work alongside you and, and what kind of yeah so so that? we have a community team as such but you know you look at the the union as a whole i think we're we're a team as a whole um and you know uh, the marco are part of that team with the community because you know we need them to connect with the kids to then want to play rugby to then want to go to a club so yeah we have um we have uh, game development officers. We're currently on the look for one in Nelson, so watch this space. <laughs> um, apply to Co. <laughs> yeah, or apply to me. Um, but that's coming out. Uh, we've got uh, Estelle, who is in the in the girls and women's space, and that's been a real. That's been one year, so that's been a huge growth for us um, because of the success of the Black Ferns. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, girls. You know, there's an opportunity there, um, but we've got to create those environments, safe environments for them to to give it a give it a go. Um, we also have Joe Mack, um, who everyone will know around uh, Clubland as Joe McLean. Um, she's like, she's the boss of me. Uh, she, I call her my work wife because she just bosses me around, and <laughs> what you, you got to keep Joe, uh, you know, in the in the good book. So uh, <laughs> she's she she helps me with the draw. Well, she does the draws. Sorry. Um, and we look in, in, in around that club health stuff. Um, we have a referee uh, guy, Stephen Kunta, came on yes, here. Yes, yes. Uh, and he's been um, he's been great value this yeah. year. He, he's, he's, um, what would you say? His um, uh, personality or his, um, yeah, he likes to have a laugh. So it, yeah. it brings something different. He um, brings some enthusiasm, doesn't he? Enthusiasm. Yeah. You, you, you wouldn't think he's as old as he is, but he, um, <laughs> you know, uh, he brings some something different. 
to do that. Space. Oh, we enjoyed him. Yeah, he's yeah, good. got yeah. good ambition yeah. for. Referee well, it's interesting Gray. seeing him in that role because yeah. you know we've seen him in the business community. He's done a lot of yes. workshops, especially around networking and different things. And he, whenever you have a workshop with him, it was always full of energy and full of vibrancy and a, a lot of fun. And so it's interesting to see him, especially in the referee's role, because in a way, it probably it's what it, it needs because you've got to try and encourage people to to pick out the whistle, don't exactly. you? Exactly, and that, yeah, and that. And that was a question um, he asked the other day. What? Why would referees referee? Yeah, you know? and that's the whole thing. Is it's a, a part of belonging to the game. You know, mm. you you might not have played, or you might have been a past player, but ultimately you can't have a game without the referees. No. You know, so yeah. that that that's uh, SC's big focus, and he's doing a great job. And then we have Q Mac uh, Quinton McDonald, mm. who you had on here. Uh, he's over in Blenheim. So again, um, his role's part community at then play um whether he's retiring or not i'm not, I'm not sure <laughs> um this year uh but who knows where, where that goes but there's we still have some uh deliverers in the school space uh activators so we have some girl active uh, female activations and then we have some you know um some of the emerging marcos going out to deliver as well to the schools ultimately to try and engage so yeah, yeah. it's a big system isn't it yeah. So after uh, JB and club rugby season sort of finish, and it moves more into a, a Tasman Marco season, um, what are the what are your or do 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 your operational responsibilities sort of shift, or does your focus shift through that period? Yeah. Um, ultimately, after club, and there's a bit of a transition period there where we do have club and reps, um, which can be quite busy but enjoyable because you know. Yeah, I love match days um, for both the NPC and the FPC because you you ultimately want to give the the best experience for the teams home and away to come into this ground, play in an environment that there shouldn't be where's this, where's that. It's just everything should be nice and set for them. Um, so, yeah, that's a big part of my role and the community role. Um in that transition period, you know, match operations around games and might not necessarily be here at um, Trafalgar or Lounsdown. It might be Murchison, you know, the Griffins, the Red Devils played down there for a couple of games. So making sure that the, the fields, the, the people that need to be in place are in place for the players, but also for the spectators. Cause mm. you know, we don't have a game without the crowd and, you know, um, putting in a good environment for, for the, adults and the kids you know so um you yeah, know i love match day and and i get a real buzz out of you know seeing one the boys and girls go out there and play well and then win and then the crowd reaction to that you know and getting the kids on the field to sign or have a photo with the boys and girls is it's a it's a buzz uh you do a good job with that mate well done um now the serious subject so there has been some concern and discussion about the health of community rugby. We read about it. We hear about it all the time, right? So how would you describe the current state of the community game? How do your numbers look for uh, regarding participation at juniors and seniors and for males and females? Pretty big question, I know, but you'll have yeah, to <laughs> mate. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, the... the... The game is the game. Um, yeah, there are lots of reviews going on at the moment, and um, our numbers are, are pretty solid. We we didn't drop this year. We had a slight increase in total numbers. So we're sitting, and, and our numbers, you know, we have our clubs and we have our school engagement, like our RIP numbers, which we do a lot of numbers through that, you know. And we, we're actually down a, a little bit in the RIP numbers, but our overall numbers were a little bit higher. So, um the the thing in with the health of club rugby is around the game and you know ultimately who wants to play and where they want to play you know so you know some people say oh the health of senior club rugby is 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 down you know and that that is probably true but it's a there's a, a couple of factors around that you know and you know the sustainability of keeping a division one team up is quite hard for clubs you know in the past teams would import five or six players in, uh, particularly from, you know, the, the islands, um, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa. But that's not probably, since COVID, it's it, it stopped as well, you know. But so local base players, uh, Paul, is there. Um, 
the real demand on the Division One player is quite high. You know, you if you're an average Joe rugby player and you just want to go and play rugby, you, you don't want to go near Division One. It's highly competitive. There's aspirational players wanting to be future Marco, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, there's a cap in that one, and then. But then you drop down to Division Two and you go out to the country and mm. you. Uh, I went out to Rewaka Huia, um, uh, semi or final, and, and the whole community vibe was great, mm. you know. And and that's the whole thing. It, it does bring community together. And you go drop down to JB. Uh, JB is a reasonably healthy. Um, uh, so you know, uh, yeah, it's just the perception out. You know, we we, we got five uh, four thousand eight hundred rugby registered players you know so that's quite a lot Mm. but you know um could we have more yes um but then it's around what those people want you know we've got some things we need to look at around um around age grade uh around weight for age type thing you know if you're a small player in today's game it's really tough you know Mm. Chis and Colby's Chis and Colby, but you know, he's mm. 75 kg of muscle, you know. So, but if you're a small player, you know, and you love the game, does is, you know, sometimes we get transfixed on rugby Saturday and and 15 aside. So we need to look at different options. You know, we're well aware of that. And and you know, um because I, I suppose th- there's a couple of pressures there, isn't there? There's for youth, there's an increase in demand from other sports you know in this day and age especially you know american sports oh, um 100%. x game type sports yeah. those kind of things then the other thing is around parents you know over protecting their children in a way and it could be that that's not the case but that's the perception that um, they're worried about their kids getting hurt and finding different ways to introduce um the game you yeah. know, at a level that they feel comfortable with, hundred percent. So you yeah. you go to that that the the more ga- more options thing. You know, growing up in Canvas Town, you had rugby, <laughs> yeah, that's and a, right, and mm. only rugby. And then in summer, you had to drive through to Blenheim to play cricket, and that's what you did. Yeah. But nowadays, I, I see it in, in my own family. Basketball, you know, that's mm. that's huge, and yeah. you know, it's centralized. It's easy. It's indoors. It's warm. Um, it's quick. It's an easy game to watch and probably rules wise it's easy you know but then you go to rugby and then there's rules changed every year and rightly so for some of them you know and you talk around the protective parents yeah i i understand that you know and that's what i was saying about am i you know if you're 45 kg 14 year old playing a 90 kg 14 year old Mm. as a parent you will have concerns, mm, you know, mm. and, and then so it's a, uh, some of it's around mindset of that player, but it's also the mindset of the 90 kg player. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We can all be a hero, mm. smash through and score five or six tries, but really mm. the stats will show that you probably won't be an all black. People will catch up to you in the next two or three years and you'll get overtaken. But, you know, this is the current situation that we're in. Um, and you, we, we've got to adapt real quick around that. How can you adapt? What do you think we could do to make the game more palatable for those parents of of the smaller child? Is it is it is it changing uh, the type of game we play? Is is flag rugby yep. a real good option? Sevens a real good option? Anything to reduce the contact? Well, I see flag footballs in the Olympics now. Yeah, you know? yeah. based so on the, gridiron. The, yeah. yeah, based on gridiron. So non-contact is is probably going to be a market for certain groups. You yeah. know, so yes, and what time, and that's sort of where we as a as a code need to look. You know, we we predominantly go March through to August, and then reps in August, September, October. Do we? You know, we're not going to encroach into December, uh, November, but sevens is an option, you know, and I think potentially the taking away of the national sevens has is, is been detrimental to that part of the game because we, we, we've got club sevens next weekend, mm-hmm. but if we had our national um, sevens, we'd do two of them, which would lead into rep, you know, mm-hmm. and then you'd have a pathway for those sevens. So, you know, you got sevens, you got rip, which we do a big, 
push on the juniors in term one, but then we sort of just do tournaments after that and we don't do anything in the teenage um, age. So that's an option that we're looking at. And what um, about the old buggers? Then the golden oldies is the other one. You know? <laughs> so there are pockets of golden oldies. We don't have a president's grade as such. I'd love to say that we could have a president's grade so you Oops, excuse me. <laughs> Thirty-five pluses could play in that. It would not even maybe. I see masters now. It might be only twenty-eight. You know, but it's for the older uh, person who still wants to play. Because w- weren't we talking about some sort of ripper tight rugby? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there was the... a, there was a conversation amongst the clubs about introducing a uh, tag rugby. Um, uh, it didn't get off the ground this year. It's something that that's got to continue being discussed and, and finding the right window and, and finding the right support for it. So, yeah, I, I see I see that as a real good option. Because it kind of brings your seniors back into the club environment, doesn't it? I Absolutely. mean, you know, I'm playing around with walking football at the moment and, you know, there's 60, 70-year-olds playing that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're all getting back into the game with injuries and everything, but there's a great camaraderie, there's fundraising, and it, and it is a separate club. It's not part of individual clubs, but potentially, that's an option um, to get your seniors back into club rugby, which is really a support base. And often the guys that will help behind the bar or help do the fields or maybe help out with junior football. So, you know, having those uh, non-contact type options would, I feel, bring a lot more people back into the game. Definitely. Like, you're not not going to be a fan of rugby, you know, and that's that's ultimately, you know, the national game, everyone's, you know, passionate about the All Blacks and passionate about the Marco and and around their club, and then if yeah, so, given that that option to play something different, yeah, whether the bodies would handle it, that's the thing, and the competitive nature uh, always. But we do need to look at that. Mm. So there's some discussion at uh, New Zealand Rugby and other levels that perhaps the MPC isn't important, but you live in a market or a region where. The, the Marco are an absolute a pinnacle. Uh, are they vital in terms of continuing the interest and in, uh, in rugby for our region, for our young people, and providing a pathway to to um, you know yeah. play at a, play at a high level? High level. You have to have those steps. You you could not go club super. So there has to be something for that aspiring player to play at, and the model as such, needs to be revisited, but I don't think you'd ever get rid of MPC. Uh, the the model of player payments and cost things, that, that may need to change, you know, going uh, to the smaller regions. You know, I watched Heartland, South Canterbury played at Tamuka. Yeah, they had a few security issues because they charged the ground and celebrated with the <laughs> last try scorer, but, you know, that had a great community feel. So, you know, I would see Wellington went, to Pyro Park, you know, and all those sort of options. So the big unions, you know, you go to Eden Park and 2,000 people in that stadium, mm-hmm. wow. You know, so, but they are sort of locked into that. So it has to be a discussion around what the game looks like. I don't think you'd lose it um, because that is the next level for our future super rugby players and all blacks, you know. I'm on your side, mate. I, I absolutely think it's critical that we have a pathway and the Marco in our region is is, is the right thing to have. We've got the academy as well, which, uh, you know, for those who have higher performance aspiration, they can go through that. But there's some people that would say that maybe there should be a merger of now, Division 1 and Division 2, where those um, high performance athletes perhaps play somewhere else and I don't know where and that club rugby is all about um, um, social. Mm. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Like there are talks of windows being in different times. I I just, yeah, there needs to be further discussion about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a big subject, isn't it? But keeping the market, absolute. Well, 100%. Keeping mm. Division 1 and Division Division 2, absolute. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Mm. In the old days, of course, we had Division One, Two, and Three, but the numbers are reducing. Um, but that's just a sign of the times. You, you talked about it. Mountain biking is huge. Basketball is huge. But touch rugby on um, on Wednesday, uh, Thursday and Friday nights. Thursday at Tahuna, Friday at Waimea. Um, good numbers, you know. Wednesday, so, Wednesday at Waimea. I was out there last night. Wednesday so at Waimea. Six yeah. fields going. Yep. 
uh, four slots. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and I, I think that's about accessibility. I, I think that you know the the elite market has to be there because um, it's potentially a career path. On you know, it is an industry, and mm. and potentially kids coming out of school have got that as a, a career path, and either as a player or administrator, or if it's physiotherapy or what have you. So. Um, so so why not? And we've we've got to keep that structure there. But also we have to create um the, the biggest market is the leisure market. Mm-hmm. And I remember well when I was at my time in Perth, it was the rugby clubs that ran the tu- the mm-hmm. off season touch mm-hmm. um uh competitions. And then even with the touch competitions, you would have a touch side that represented uh, that district, that rugby district at state titles that they used to have it, you know, and then they'd have a WA representative. I mean Eddie Jones is starting to talk about the same thing with mm-hmm. Australian rugby. You know, we have to have a, a, and I believe it all comes back to the clubs. That's where it starts because you can provide the leisure market environment. Uh, often there's a club rooms attached to it. Uh, my favourite time was Friday nights playing touch, yeah. not going to the pub necessarily, yeah. but playing and then catching up socially. And then on the weekends, it'd be tournaments or what have you. And then through that, you've got your pathways. Um, and you could be playing 85kg, you could be you know, there's all sorts of options, mm. but the clubs are the best spot for that. And then, of course, you create that pathway through to regional rugby of whatever type that may be, and then on to, you know, higher honour. I guess the question is, you know, will they get rid of super rugby? Probably not because there's too much rug, you know, in it. But we have to have something underneath that feeding mm-hmm. that. Um, uh, we keep on saying, mate, that yeah. the Australians would love to have something like the MPC in their competition because it's it's the difference between their standards and ours. So, okay, yes. last question. How would you sell rugby? What's the positive things that you would say to someone, a parent, about what rugby can offer? You know, talked around, you know, some lifelong mates, you know, mateship and that camaraderie that comes with rugby. Uh, I don't, and, and that is connected back to those club rooms. Uh, I do get that. Um, so it's, it's camaraderie and, you know, positive, you know, for, for, for the, the, the kids coming through. Yep. There are some negative aspects that we need to help try and alleviate negative coaches, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have a positive coach, there's only a, you're going to be one team that wins the whole thing, you know, championship. But if even if you're a positive coach um, and realistic coach, then those teams that still don't win still have, have a good time. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah. that's what, for me, is is knowing your li- limitations or whatever, or knowing where your team sits, but ultimately mm-hmm. encouragement and ha- getting the, participants the players and the supporters a good experience and, and so and from that you create lifelong mates yeah, you know? yeah to me it's about whānau mm-hmm. and, and 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 the thing is is that we we talk about you know crime in our country and we talk about gangs a, a large part of people getting drawn into gangs is because they don't have uh, a family environment that they're happy with not all i'm generalizing um but a big positive that you have mm. and the opportunity we have in this country is the club scene in the whānau mm. where the senior players and your coach often can become a father figure mm. in a leading role, you know, and I think it's a hell of a lot more positive than it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there were some hard guys back in those yeah. days, but I think that we have evolved as a human race over time. We've got lots of gr- fantastic role models, fantastic people, you know, giving positive experiences and, you know, a chance to go and occupy the kids on a Saturday or whenever it might be. I, I think that's the crux of it. And as you say, it's mates for life. Yeah, exactly. You know, and not everybody's into sport, you know. So this, what we're talking about, though, is we're talking about the growth of sport and what that brings. And at the end of the day, to me, it's a, it's about creating that whānau yeah, environment. Sure. But we, I think we're all the same. Once you've been part of a club or played for a club for a while, you know, ten ten years later, you're still claiming to be part of that club. Yeah, regardless. absolutely. And that's that's sort of what the offer is there. And and it's probably rugby is um, a bigger draw card in that sense than probably most other sports. To be fair, yeah, yeah, it's all about connectivity, connections with with people, with whānau. 
for Fano with other people. And I think that's that's what I love about the game and I love about my club and the fact that it's got values that uh, are important and, and kids can learn a lot from a club growing up through through the years. And, and in that club environment, most people, as you pointed out before, they're not always just focused on elite. If if they go and have a game uh, at C grade and enjoy themselves mm-hmm. and then uh, go and grab something to eat, shower up and then watch the main game, that in itself is a great day out, isn't it? So Yeah, yeah I, was, I was thinking the other day if I wasn't doing rugby on a sad day, what else would I be doing? <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah. um, and that, that that's a big part of it is is your – that's what, what – you know, you love. And so, you know, you'd be doing the weeding and the gardens and I don't have pristine gardens, but nah, that <laughs> yeah. doesn't, that's not fun. You know? yeah. Saturday's a rugby day. <laughs> Very good. All right, Kahu, look, I uh, really appreciate you coming in okay. and um, it's great insight into, you know, the challenges you got with the community game and, and where it's all evolving. And uh, you've been at the coalface for quite a while now, haven't you? So, you got a pretty good picture and uh, lots of great relationships with a lot of people. So we really appreciate uh, you taking time out to come and have a chat to us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right, lads. Um, huge weekend, isn't it? It's going to be uh, yeah, mate, it's another start, marathon. It's starting to build already. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, it will be, man. Oh, yeah. Uh, Saturday, Saturday morning, aren't we? Eight o'clock. Mm. And then um, yeah, we'll go again Sunday morning. I think those eight o'clock games are absolutely yeah, wonderful perfect. time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's terrific to yeah. be able to get up and be energized and then watch and then yeah. celebrate. And we will be celebrating after after Saturday at 10 a.m. Good stuff. Nice positive note to end on. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you to our listeners, and we'll talk to you again next week. The Marco Rugby Roundup. What's on, where, and when? It's the talk of Nelson. Talk Nelson Radio.